Hi and welcome to Alta Heron. My name is Rob Runacres and I'm very pleased to be at the Tour de Hercules event in A Coruña in Galicia. Uh, I hope I pronounced that right and apologies if I haven't. So we're on the first full day. We started yesterday evening. Uh, we've got David Pascal's small sword class at the back. Um, so David is one of the teachers. Oriel Salvador, of course, is here. Um, he will be teaching longsword. Tom Pue has already done something on Montante. We've got Chris Chatfield from the 1595 Club here. And also, um, we've got Dave Rawlins has come out from the UK too. I'm here, I'll be teaching uh, sword and dagger, as usual. And also I'm doing something on target and side sword. I'm very pleased to be here. So I'll be bringing some interviews from the event and uh, hopefully some videos, some of the sparring, some of the things that is going on. So stick with me and uh, I hope to speak to you soon. We're on day two of Toro de Hercules and we've got Chris Chatfield now who is teaching quarterstaff or pole arm from the Saviolo method. And we've got Biggie there who is translating. She does a very, very good job of translating for all of us whose uh, language skills aren't as good as they perhaps should be. And here we have Dave Rawlins, who is teaching, I think he's teaching Cavendish at the moment. I don't really want to interrupt him to ask. Uh, so there's three Brits here this year, who are all of us teaching our various things. Hi, so I'm joined by my good friend Iago Santelitis. Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, okay. That's okay, fine. fantastic. The Ferrum Armouries. Uh, it's quite a new armouries. It's, it's uh, making rapiers at the moment and is looking at other things. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about the company? About the company, I'm worried. Sounds very big, but we are not too big now. Um, our idea of trying to make, uh, to make a living from, from, from Mina, from Mina. So, um, we thought that uh, there's a little uh, space in, uh, on this uh, on armors, Rima. There is a, uh, a new model as well. Usually, you, it's all made by hand. And we are trying to make uh, tools, good tools, but uh, very pointed to the to the right uh, um, kind of uh, sword fighting that you, have, uh, that you want to, to do. And uh, we want to make the, the swords, um, I know how to tell it, um, just, uh, just what you need, not uh, with a lot of uh, um, uh, decoration, yeah, so not, not, not very decorated. So. Because certainly for the rapier community, getting a sword can be quite difficult, um, yeah, there's right often now. a long lead time uh, and so on. So we've got a couple of the swords here that we'll show you. One of them is mine, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> uh, so if we just want to grab one. Um, so uh, is this one mine? Yeah. So here we are. This is the uh, the hilt, and the main thing for me is the the blade. It's um, it's it's uh, obviously flexes very very nicely, um, but it's a little bit stiffer in the binds. And some of the trouble I have with other sword manufacturers is that. They tend to be a little bit floppy. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is this something you're really working on? Yeah, uh, uh, we were working with uh, Tom Poe from the beginning to make a proper swap to uh, initially rather, but uh, it can be used to, to, our, uh, to our masters. But uh, what we were looking at is a sword that can make a proper adapter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for that you need to, the, the sword to be strong, but it has to, uh, to flex in other words. Uh, yeah. Do you think this is a problem with uh, sword makers who are trying to be historically accurate and having a diamond sh uh, profile blade? Because we know that if you use a triangular shaped blade it might not look the part, but of course it, it, it stays stiff. Do you think it's the difficulty of, of, with the diamond shape to get the balance right there? You either go well, too stiff, which makes it dangerous, or, or too painful. I, I think that um, there's, a, there's a difficult point that is that um, all of us want to, to be historical uh, accurate. Mm. But uh, we are not using the, the same steel that they used before. So uh, now we are using better steels. Uh, and you have to, to change a little the, the shape to, to match the, the new steel with the, with the old uh, shape. Um, the, the diamond uh, form is important, the diamond shape is important, but uh, you have to uh, to make it uh, um, a little less, uh, I don't know how to say it, 
not not too much uh, tall from the from the center. You have to uh, make you have it, to cut it down yeah. more. So you have to, it has to be thinner and ground down more. Because okay. uh, the the shape form uh, make uh, the um, the rhomboid form uh -huh. make the the, the sword stiffer. I mean, you need to be a little flexible. Uh, the problem too is that uh, we need to this uh, blade to be flexible, mm. but not at all the whole blade. Yeah, we need it flexible almost in the in the in the last part, yeah. and uh, you have to do it with uh, with a shape because the, the steel is always the same. You can't do it uh, with a uh, thermal the thermal process, mm -hmm. but it's more difficult. It's better to to have the same. Uh, the same thermal work and on, on, on all the blade and make it with a with the shape. You know? And to be clear, what you're aiming to do is, um, in many ways, get a mass production out there of, of blades well, and so on. Not, well, not I use the term mass in advisedly, but not exactly a huge use, but to, to try and make them more available to a wider market. Yeah, so uh, we want uh, to, to be able to, to give you a sort of uh, Three months since you yep. ordered. Because I know that a lot of the uh, very popular rapier um, makers at the moment now, they're either closing down or new orders, or they're sort of saying it's going to be two years until you get a yeah. sword, which obviously means, well, it's, it's impractical <laughs> in many ways, though quite understandable. So, look, can we talk about the dimensions of this? This is yes. according to the Imperial Standard of Spanish Court? Yes, yep. it's uh, according to the Imperial uh, Standards, but it's a uh, it's exactly the Rada score. Okay. So, uh, well, the measures in Rada is in uh, Paras and, uh, and Dedos, but we have uh, changes to the not in Vivio, so okay. <laughs> yeah, we, we got in the international system. Yeah. And they are uh, 104 uh, from the Vivio, uh -huh. that is the, that's the Imperial standard. And then uh, we got uh, 27.2. Uh, centimeters pinion for the pinion, yep. and uh, a seven centimeters for uh, deep, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the deep gap. Sorry, yep. uh, seven centimeters, and I think that uh, fourteen is uh, the wide of the of the gap. Um, the in, in Rada's uh, manuscript, they he also talks about uh, the grip, the, the length of the grip. But that's uh, we have made a little change there. Uh, we always cut the grip uh, to the measures of the owner's hand. Yeah. So if you buy as a as well, we are going to cut it because uh, to, to do this trade, it's important that the the pommel rests in that part of yeah. the of the hand. So it's one thing that we we do for free and now we can. Okay. Um, now, obviously, I've been accused of being vulgar this treasure, but just to see, it's a very snug um, fit, just there, a double finger um, on this. It's a very, very comfortable one. One of the things I like about this is um, it has uh, quite a, um, a thick uh, grip, which fits a little more snugly into the hand. Uh, okay, what, what's the future then? What other things are you looking at doing at Ferro? Well, um we know that we, we cannot live with a uh, rapier so mm -hmm. uh, we are working now on the daggers, uh, same dagger. Uh, we are working on uh, night with night sword uh, for uh, one for the three. So an arming sword. Yeah. Yeah. Arming, arming. yeah. Okay. An arming sword, and uh, we will have uh, um, the strength of battle very soon. Ah, uh, excellent. Yes. Well, uh, fifty-five centimeters. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the larger buckler that's described by Raja, isn't yes. it? Which is, I think, the length of a Spanish dagger, if I recall right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, I think uh, they are uh, two times as well. Yeah. Okay. And uh, we are working on uh, the rest of the keeping. We are having, uh, we are going to have a uh, mask and uh, gloves and so But we are working on Okay, fantastic. Lastly, what is your website address? Okay, our, web, our website is ferronarmory.com. Okay, so we'll put a link up on there. I hope the sound quality is uh, okay. Uh, unfortunately, there's a, a lot of this Chris Chaplin banging away with uh, his sticks. Um, so, Iago, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. 
So I'm joined here by Chris Chatfield of the 1595 Club, who has finally agreed to uh, be interviewed by me. We've interviewed a number of his senior students. Um, so how did you end up in Akaronia this year? Uh, just me, uh, Tom, uh, the wife of Tom, the wonderful Tom. Uh, and I got, as a, uh, I've got to know Tom quite a lot of this year. We've been working quite a bit together with Guy Rennix, mm-hmm. uh, with Roberto Gomez, um, and Museum. Uh, yeah, and he invited me over. It was a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Okay, and uh, you were doing staff at probably the most packed workshop I've seen in a long time. Um, mm-hmm. How many people do you have there? Must be more than 50 or so. I think we've seen very big. Yeah. yeah, and you also did Cutlass, yes. which um, I got very excited about. That was quite fun. That yep. was fun. Yeah. Uh, and uh, also um, proceeded to punch people as well at a private they, party. They asked, yeah, to have a private punching party. Excellent. Yeah. You weren't invited. No, I know, yeah. which is often the case. Um, probably after last night, I'll never be well, invited again. Um, at least they've got photographs. <laughs> <laughs> you can never take those memories away. Yeah, okay. Moving on fairly swiftly then. How have you found the event overall? It's been great. Um, as you'd expect, the people have been marvellous. Um, the setting has been great. And the atmosphere is wonderful. I think I really enjoyed watching people fence and the way that people worked in the workshops. Yes, yeah, it, it was good. Now, 1595 Club has got a very, very distinct style based from Saviolo. That's one of the, yeah, it's kind of, um, as with all treatos, I think, you know, we've taken ideas from it and run with it. I, can't, I wouldn't ever say that it was any more than interpretation, which is obviously coloured by my experience. Yeah, and you, you, you boxed for many, many years yeah. as well, haven't you? Yeah, so going my from boxing to uh, classical sabre, sports sabre for many years, mm-hmm. and then discovered discovered the treat ideas. I think that's um, something we, we talked a little about uh, with Dave is that, is that sort of journey of interpretation. Um, do you find that you are still developing an interpretation or do you have a, a sort of a core formula that you try and work around? <clears throat> I think it's changed over the years. I think there was a period when you're desperately trying to understand what a particular author is trying to say and that becomes very important to you. And then after a while when you kind of feel comfortable with what you're doing and you've made it work in the way that you want it to work uh, or in the same way you want to put it, then I think you kind of expand it because obviously you can't write fencing down particularly well. So you have to, I think you have to, what, what those, I think for me the, the treat are best for asking, you know, asking to, to ask as a modern swordsman because the problems they might have encountered people who are unfortunate enough to have to fence for real mm. have different questions and different solutions to us as, as you know, people who fence for pleasure. Do you find, though, that uh, you, you could be accused of being guilty of trying to force everything into this one formula? Um, I think you have to... Uh, I think we're influenced with the same differences. I mean, you read a treatise, you will take something from it. Sorry. How do you find it when you come to these events, though? You, you've got such a unique style, uh, or the 5095 Club has, has, has quite a unique style, and you're coming up against what might be called a more classic form uh, of, of fencing. Um, is, that, is that really the real test of your system, then? Yeah, I suppose so. Um, I think rather than have a system's a difficult word, I think it's more for, it's a, a philosophy, it's more combat. Mm. Rather than techniques, it's um, eventually you're training people to think. It's you know, kind of problem solving, isn't it? So, a particular system gives you, uh, you know, a certain set of skills to be able to interpret something. So you can't fence certain people in a very kind of pure way. If mm. you like. So you have to, you have to be able to adapt. And I think that's probably the most important thing: is being able to adapt to what's in front of you or who's in front of you. And lastly, the 5095 Club is, is sort of spreading its wings across the world now, isn't well, it? Yeah, you're in strangely. northern Italy, you're in Ireland. Yep. Is this a, a conscious effort to expand um, your philosophy, to share that philosophy, or is this just more it's of an organic just, thing? It's kind of organically happened. We, um, I think through doing the international events, people, for the Italy thing, people just kind of like what we did. Mm. And were, you know, bless them, were willing to come over and travel and study with us, um, which is great. Um, it's nice that we can inspire people like that. 
uh, the island was one of the guys who I was teaching in, in Brighton, he moved over to Ireland and kind of kept again. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it's kind of, it's not been a, you know, a, a world domination plan, it's just, um, just happened and it was there with the right people to do it. Final note. Yes. A little bit sensitive. Oh, no. Um, we've, we've had a couple of comments that, uh, that, well, to each other that we're getting on a bit. Um, and uh, yes, obviously have. the fencing is changing. How would you, uh, how would you describe that change? How's that affecting um, the way in which you're not only obviously physically fencing, but mentally? Um, I think as you get older, you have to, you have to uh, compensate for your diminished <laughs> physical prowess. Sure, <laughs> say so. I think you yeah. become, you become more, more cerebral um, about it. Uh, I think actually one of the nice things about fencing is that because you never stop learning, you're always, you're always adapting and changing. You, you subconsciously adapt the way you move because you have to. Yeah. Um, I suppose we should have thought of that in the bar last night. <laughs> we didn't think of much. No. <laughs> There was a bar? Yes. There were several. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's difficult. I think that's one of the joys, isn't it? Because it is a journey. Mm. Um, and, yeah, of course, you're going to change the way that you approach these things. Because you have to. Yep. Yeah. You were talking about fighting like young dogs? Yes, indeed. I suppose the old whip dogs that we are. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yes. On that note, I think. Yes. Stop. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. Go for a drink. Yes. Yeah. Chris Chatfield, Coffee. thank you very thank much. You. Pleasure. So I'm joined here by Philip Bond from Bruges, Brugge, uh, from the Halabadeers. Hi. All right. <laughs> okay, so this is your second time in Acheronia. What, what made you come back? Uh, you. <laughs> no, sorry. So well, what of made course, you come I mean, back? Well, what made me come back, of course, I mean, it's the, it's the people. Uh, um, so I've been traveling Spain for the last three, four years. Mm -hmm. for, um, so the main events, let's say, okay, uh, Toledo, everybody knows Toledo. It's already like the 15th edition, I think. Mm. A Coruña is it was this year the 10th edition. So it's also becoming a very uh, stable value, let's yep. say, into Hima and it, into the Hima world. Um, I've seen things change a little. Um, in Spain, used to be like this. This um, it's quite insular, wasn't it? Quite exactly. closed in some ways. Exactly, quite closed. Maybe the language barrier, maybe the um, uh, the focus more on rapier, uh, because we we all know and we all agree that in the north of Europe, longsword is more like the main weapon. Yeah. Uh, Spain, uh, like you said, it's it's pretty closed. They focus a lot on rapier and especially on Spanish rapier. Yeah, uh, since we started exploring the Destreza world in Bruges a couple of years back, then for me it was a very important source of information, of experience, and of course meeting nice people. I must say the people in uh, Spain are very warm, very warm-hearted. There's a language barrier sometimes, but if you can overcome that, I mean, it's uh, an ideal uh, uh, ground to get yourself acquainted with of course, the stress up, but also with the Spanish culture, and mm. in, in a whole. And I, I like to let's say, um, I like to put that in a package as a whole. I mean, yeah. studying a style or studying a specific work or book. I mean, combining it with the art, with the culture, with the uh, food, for example. I think it's 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 something that. So you're looking for yeah. something all encompassing, and if you get that from yes. uh, the, the Spanish event, yes. But you're, um, I mean, you're, you're kind of a, a hidden gem in many ways, because uh, you're the uh, the guy who's really starting to bring Destreza certainly into um, uh, you know, the the lowland areas as well. And you've done a lot of work on Chad Tibo Danver, haven't you? Well, not a lot of work. I must admit, I started out with Tibo Danvers because, of course, I mean, he was a fellow countryman, and it's always nice to study somebody who you relate with as geographically, let's say, or the origins. Uh, there was also an excellent biography written by a, a Dutch librarian who died, passed away, I think, in the 80s or the 90s, and uh, describes the, the life of Tibo Danvers. I, do, I actually do not know why he chose the life of a fencer as a, as a, mm. as a subject to write a biography. But uh, yeah, it, it intrigued me. But uh, okay, most people they've heard of Thibault. Maybe a little less people they have the translation by mm. um, 
the American yeah, um, yeah, yeah. into English because of course that's more uh, that's more approachable. The original is in French, is of course Renaissance French. Uh, but from the moment I started with Thibault, I said like, okay, this is like very high level stuff already. Yep. This is Thibault, the structure and the work from Thibault is completely different than the structure, the mainstream Spanish Destreza masters mm. keep in their works like Pacheco, like Rada, like Etenard. Uh, so the, the, the Spanish mainstream Destreza masters, they really try to build up from the beginning. They start with footwork, they start with basic mathematical geometry they they explain everything very detailed uh, but that's actually a bit lacking I'm not say lacking in in inside the, the work but this the structure is lacking you cannot really start reading Thibault in, in my in my yeah. view you cannot really start reading Thibault like you would start reading um, uh, Etenard for example so from the moment I started with Thibault I said okay this is this is way too complicated I really need to have a a different approach to this. So I, I actually thought like, uh, I was thinking like, uh, okay, what did Thibault do? He went to Spain, he studied Destreza, he came back and then he adapted a few things and then he uh, started winning tournaments, whatever, wrote his book and that's how Thibault came to be a known uh, name into the fencing world. So I started with Pacheco, I started with uh, Rada uh, to play around with him and yeah, just by digging deeper, I saw, I saw these these overlapping theories as well in the mainstream Destreza uh, masters as in the Thibault manuscript. So I'm now exploring this. I'm looking it from the perspective from from mainstream Spanish Destreza, and it helps me in deciphering mm. how Thibault. Uh, yeah. And in fact, you Sorry. gave a very good seminar workshop uh, at the International oh, Rapier uh, seminar in um, uh, in Strasbourg um, earlier. Uh, you, you. you were comparing Thibaut with was it was it a particular um, Destreza author you were trying yes, to follow? Yes, a particular particular uh, Destreza technique. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a, it's a cometimiento perfecto. Okay, it's a it's a. But was that, sorry, was that Pacheco's description of it, or was it a, a, a more generalized? It was a Rada description. Okay, it Rada, was a Rada okay. description. Uh, Pacheco also describes it, but as we know, there are slight differences between Pacheco and Rada as body com uh, body posture, uh, some footwork. Basically, it's the same, but um, uh, it was interesting to see it from the Spanish uh, mm. point of view, and then, of course, apply it to the uh, Thibault point of view. Because, of course, Thibault doesn't use, because the work... Thibault's work is in French, so he doesn't use the uh, the Spanish uh, terminology. Yeah. So he cannot really, literally, I mean, say, okay, that technique is described as that technique. Whereas in in the uh, in the other uh, manuscripts, you can. I mean, uh, Tretas Generales is Tretas Generales. Of course, there are differences. Yeah, the Thibault technique. I mean, it's it's not literally. Uh, like I said, the structure of of Thibault's book is 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 different. Mm -hmm. Like you have these vast amount of circles in one chapter or in one drawing, let's say, one, one uh, overview of, of, of chapter. And uh, he jumps like, okay, you start with circle number one, and then he's like, okay, go to circle number two, and from circle number two, circle number two, you can either go to three or you can go to four. So he, he builds it up like you like would see a tree, for example, where this is like a different approach when you look at the other fencing monsters. So, but, that's why, I mean, if you take a, a simple technique from the mainstream Spanish Destreza, it's you really need to look before you find the, the equivalent, let's, let's say the equivalent of uh, Thibault in, in his work. But I, I think it's very, it's, it, it's very interesting. And it, it's important in a way that we can put Thibault more into perspective, but because there's still a lot of people who say, yeah, Thibault, he, yeah, he might be in Destreza, he might be... Uh, but he's not really important. So I like to turn that around. Mm -hmm. I would like to turn that around at, the, at a specific moment in, in the future and say like, yeah, but Thibault was a valuable addition to what we know today as Destreza. Do you feel that that's um, uh, a, naturally the Spanish are going to want to deal with more, more Spanish things. And uh, for me, perhaps Thibault, one requires some basic fundamental knowledge first before approaching Thibault. Um, and so because of this disjoint, you kind yes. of need to get that sort of yeah. more general distress, I think. Because, of course, Thibaut is, is writing for a teacher, isn't he? He's actually, uh, in many ways, yes. saying you need to take your students yeah. through this. So it's, it's perhaps it's, it has assumed knowledge behind it yes. uh, that's going in. And so 
you are very much, as you're saying, following that sort of basic groundwork before you're approaching Thibaut. Yeah, of course, with Thibaut, you have to consider the fact that actually you needed Thibaut as well as the book. I mean, you had the book and with the book alone, this was like the guidelines. This was it is structured in a specific way, but you actually needed somebody who was trained by Thibaut's, let's say, fencing school to be able to... Um, to be able to understand, to be able to get the message across to your pupils. So yeah, I think this is very, very pronounced char characteristic of Thibault's, of, of Thibault's work. What you're saying is interesting there because it's almost as if you're going to fail in your attempt to bring Thibault to life if, well, we, if we don't have yes. the individual there. I mean, we are, we, we, we are historians, one hopes, but we're also experimental archaeologists, exactly. I guess, in yes, a way. Yes, yes, you're trying to revive something that is, I mean, yeah, you're trying to revive uh, something that's on paper. And, and, of course, I mean, yeah, it is not like a, a, a painting or a sculpture where you can see and, 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 and more... Uh, let's say, relate to what you are seeing or what you are touching, uh, for example. So, yeah, the, the book is just a means to, 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 um, to uh, uh, preserve knowledge. But, of course, the knowledge is in the body, is in how you, how you, pose, your, uh, how you pose yourself against your opponent, how you, how you handle the blade, how you handle the weapon. Also, like, the, 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 where is the balance in the weapon? It's, it's in the books, of course, in, 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 in a way of, of written text and information, but that doesn't make you a, um, a proficient... Reading the book doesn't make you a proficient fencer or m makes you able to, sure. to reproduce a, a blade very accurate to, to what they were used to handle, for example. Yeah. I think, I think I'm just intrigued by your comment that um, we can perhaps never attain exactly. beyond a certain yeah. level a competency in a, in a given system. Well... Uh, in Thibault is special in a way as well. I mean, his book is actually two books, and like in between or in between those two books, there are like copper plates or, or let's say drawings. There's no explanation in, mm. in the book about the drawings. There are chariots uh, drawn by these mythologi mythological creatures. I mean, there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of Latin uh, on the walls, whatever. I mean. Why would you include a, a, a picture like that if there's no hidden meaning behind it? So mm. there are people actually doing a lot of research um, specifically around this thing, like our Alvin uh, mm -hmm. Guttals is a, is a very good yes. researcher on that, on that level. So let's hope he, yeah, he, can, he can help the understanding of the book. So uh, because he, he, apart from the fencing thing, uh, the, the fencing information that, that's inside the manual of Tibu, he also concentrates, of course, on the, on the more esoteric and the more like hidden messages that are supposed to be in the book. So that, that's good to, to, to have these different perspectives on that, on that work. Uh, yeah. Philip Bond, thank you for all this information. You're welcome. Um, and um, let's go for a coffee. Good idea.